that first couple of years, it was, you know, a lot of people uh, chose where they hunted based on where they lived and where they worked. You know, I can be here in five minutes from my office. I can, you know, this is only two minutes from my house. And it sorted itself out pretty well. Some of the, the more high profile areas like uh, some parks, uh, we have uh, an arboretum here on campus. And, uh, you know, some of the, the higher profile where there was going to be a lot of interfacing with the public, uh, there were some guys that volunteered for that. And uh, they wanted to represent bow hunters. Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast, episode number 238. Rick Bebout, the Morgantown Urban Archers, a blueprint for city deer hunting. Support for the Big Buck Registry and the Deer Hunt Podcast comes from Hunter's Blend Coffee. Awaken your hunt with coffee purchased directly from farmers around the world, creating jobs and alleviating poverty. Hunter's Blend Coffee, we're hunters too. Polar Works Coolers and the Chill Zone, specializing in the most durable, reliable thermal cups and coolers. Keep your drinks hot or cold in any element. Covert scouting cameras, remote cameras for hunting, wildlife, and security. Morse's Sporting Goods, a full line of sporting goods without the sales tax. And Big Buck merch. You can get cool, high-quality Big Buck t-shirts, long-sleeve t-shirts, and hoodies. And show support for this podcast by visiting www.bigbuckregistry.com forward slash M-E-R-C-H. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. This is Henry Moncrief from Alstead, New Hampshire, and you're listening to my favorite podcast, the Big Buck Registry. Hey guys, this is Robbie Kroger from Blood Origins. You're about to listen to my favorite podcast, the Big Buck Registry. Hello everyone, this is Ulrich Oskov from Oskov Hunting, and you're about to listen to my favorite hunting podcast, The Big Bug Registry. Hello ladies and gentlemen and fellow predators, my name is Jay, and thank you for tuning in to The Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. For Dusty Phillips and Jim Keller and the entire staff here at The Big Buck Registry, welcome to this week's show. There are a couple things I'd like you to do for us if you could. If you would, please check us out on iTunes subscribe and leave us a review with your help we're going to try and push this show up the itunes charts i know we have a lot of listeners out there and i need you to take some action i need you to leave a review and subscribe to the show if you do subscribe that'll give you access and notification each and every week that a new show is released you can also access this show in its entirety on youtube stitcher tune in radio iheart radio spotify and google play it's all right there for you to access on demand at your fingertips Regarding the harness program, we have an ample supply of harnesses to give away from our volunteer donors. If you're in need of a full body harness, please send an email to j at bigbuckregistry.com. When deer populations inside city limits, somewhere in urban town USA, gets out of control to the point where citizens complain about vegetation and landscape damage and an overabundance of deer vehicle collisions, as a city government, what do you do? You could call a company like White Buffalo and have professional sharpshooters call the herd, or perhaps go the sterilization route like we witnessed on Staten Island. Or you could just do what bow hunters do best, hunt the deer with bow-armed volunteer citizens in an organized, controlled, discreet manner. That's exactly what Rick Bebout and a group of 80 bow hunters did in Morgantown, West Virginia. Backed by the support of the city, the Morgantown Urban Archers were formed. It brought me to those in need, it effectively knocked down the deer numbers, and gained the trust and support of the residents of Morgantown, all on an extremely low budget, all based on the concept of letting skilled bow hunters do what they normally and naturally do anyway. Makes sense to me. We'll turn to our entire interview with Rick Bebout in just one moment, but before we do, let's turn to Jim Keller for the deer news. Folks, I want to tell you about one of the best coolers I've found for the price in quite a while. I was with my family the other day, and I couldn't believe the price on the cooler I was looking at. I always wanted one of those high-end coolers because of the quality that I had heard of, but I couldn't justify the price. Then I found Polar Works. Finally, I found a company that understands quality and affordability. 
The Polar Works lineup is extensive and is filled with polar cups, polar tubs, and polar soft coolers. What do I love about these coolers? Well, for one, the ice stays frozen for a long, long period of time. But they've thought of other things in their design. For example, drain speed. No one likes a slow drain after a long weekend on the trail. The Polar Lock System. You're always protecting your valuable beverages from thirsty outsiders. And there's the non-slip polar feet. Polar feet will prevent sudden movement when you're on the move. There's the sweat-free material, so you don't have to worry about cleaning up puddles when you're finished with your journey. Polar tubs hold ice for such a long period of time because of the 3-inch insulated walls, the heavy-duty gaskets, and the fail-proof hinges, which guarantee a freezer-tight seal. So check out PolarWorks.com when you're considering your next high-quality cooler without breaking the bank. That's www.polarworkz.com. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. Our first story this week, Texas man sentenced in poaching a white-tailed buck. This story is from the KENS Channel 5 CBS News website. A North Texas man has been sentenced this week for violating legal hunting hours while hunting the second largest white-tailed buck ever in Texas. Travis D. Johnson of Aubrey, Texas, was sentenced in Denton County Court to two years probation and 40 hours community service plus court costs. He also faces in excess of $53,000 in civil restitution fines from the Texas State Parks and Wildlife Department and is prohibited from purchasing a hunting license for the duration of his deferred adjudication period. The Texas Parks and Wildlife Department says Johnson claimed to have shot the buck at 7.30 p.m. within legal shooting hours, but investigators became aware of rumors circulating on social media that he had killed the animal after that time. Through the investigation, game wardens say they gathered evidence that led to Johnson's confession that he harvested the deer after legal hunting hours and on property he was not supposed to be hunting on. Game wardens say if Johnson had harvested the buck legally, it would have ranked as the highest scoring deer ever taken with a bow and arrow in Texas. (laughs) Buffalo man faces $4,500 in fines for shooting deer with crossbow from bedroom window. This story is from the NYUP website and was reported by David Figuera. A man living in a Buffalo suburb where hunting is banned year-round faces $4,500 in fines after being ticketed for allegedly shooting an eight-point buck out of his bedroom window over bait earlier this month. And it wasn't the first time the man, James R. McCack, 57, of Lackawanna, has been charged with illegally taking deer in the community. The most recent incident occurred on January 8th. It was reported by the State Department of Environmental Conservation, which responded to a heads-up the next day from Lackawanna City Police concerning an eight-point buck that was shot in a resident's backyard. After police identified a suspect, State Environmental Conservation Officer Tim McNeeka searched the DEC database and discovered that McCack had been charged illegally with taking deer in Lackawanna in 2011, DEC said. After finding 50 pounds of cracked corn on the ground in a lengthy interview with McCack, it was determined that the deer had been shot with a crossbow out of the bedroom window of the man's residence, DEC said. Lackawanna is a closed area for deer hunting, DEC noted, adding that the regular deer hunting season had been closed for weeks. McNeeka issued summons for taking deer out of season, hunting deer over bait, killing deer except as permitted in a closed area, and unlawfully feeding deer. McCack faces fines of up to $4,500 and court surcharges. McCack is scheduled to appear in Lackawanna City Court to answer the charges on February 13th. Captain Robert Janowski of the Lackawanna Police Department said his department is also investigating the recent incident. He said today that additional charges may be filed against McCack. He said that McCack paid a total of $1,500 in fines for the 2011 incident. Hunter Pink debate fades due to lack of support in State House of Representatives. This story is from the Detroit News website and was written by Kathleen Gray. The debate over pink versus orange in the Michigan woods is beginning to fade. After a second committee hearing this week on a bill that would allow hunters to wear bright pink in addition to blaze orange while they're hunting in the woods, the chairman of the committee said there's not enough support for the change in state policy. The impasse came after the State Department of Natural Resources, the Michigan United Conservation Clubs, Democrats on the committee, and a Republican lawmaker came out in opposition of the bill. The State Natural Resources Commission ruled in September that blaze orange was the safest color for hunters to wear when they're hunting, negating a bill that was passed by the legislature in 2016. Hunters can still wear bright pink in the woods, but also must incorporate at least 50% blaze orange into their outerwear. The sponsors of legislation hope that allowing a pink clothing option for hunters would attract more women to the sport, 
which has seen a decline in the number of hunting licenses since 2011, when 763,817 licenses were issued to 2016, when 699,399 licenses were sold to hunters. The number of women hunters has increased slightly during the same time frame from 72,800 licenses in 2011 to 75,134 in 2016. But Sarah Engel, president of the Women's Hunting and Sporting Association, which is based in Wisconsin, a state that does allow hunter pink in the woods, said the policy is a misguided attempt to attract women to the sport. Among the group of women I hunt with, we find it insulting and demeaning, she told the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel last year when the policy was implemented in Wisconsin. And a memo turned into the committee last week by a supporter of the legislation didn't help matters. In part, the memo read, Women prefer to always look and feel attractive, even while hunting. Having pink as an option can help with any insecurities over what they are wearing. Pink is a color that can immediately identify a female. Women don't want to be mistaken for men, even from a distance or in the woods. The memo prompted an outpouring of eye rolls and outrage on social media and the bill, HB 5416, has been placed on the back burner. And just a reminder for any of our listeners around Michigan, I will be at the Michigan Deer and Turkey Expo at the Lansing Center on February 17th. I will, of course, be sporting the stylish Big Buck Registry hoodie, so please stop by and say hi if you see me. That concludes this week's edition of the Big Buck Registry's Deer News. Special thanks once again to Daniel Applebaum, who provided the leads on all the stories this week. For links to the stories featured this week, please check our show notes at www.bigbuckregistry.com. If you have any ideas for future topics or have any questions about any of these topics, please email me at jim at bigbuckregistry.com. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. Well, thanks to Jim Keller for the Deer News. Without further ado, here is Rick B. Bout. Rick Bebout, welcome to the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. How are you, my friend? I'm really good. Thanks for having me on today, Jay. You've got a fascinating story to tell. Can't wait to get into this. Well, it's it's something that I'm very proud of, and, and I know that all the men and women uh, that hunt in our, our city hunt are proud of, and I think it's something that uh, you know the citizens of Morgantown have come to really appreciate as well. This is neat. This is a this is a feel good story from the start, in in the a deer hunting sense, and a you know, helping out that that middle ground. I think this is this is a very good example of why deer hunting is important and how it can help communities, despite that eighty percent that d- doesn't care, and the other twenty percent that hates us. Um, so this is a yeah. this is good. This is very good. Rick, let's let's get into a little bit about you. Who are you? Where are you from? Okay, I was uh, born and raised here in in Morgantown. Uh, very fortunate to be brought up in a, a very active hunting family. Uh, I think the earliest I was out in the field, I was four or five years old, following my my dad, and my uncle, uh, and my cousin uh, on rabbit hunts. As I got older, uh, I started uh, squirrel hunting and things of that nature. My first bow hunt when it was at the age of 12. Uh, again, very fortunate to have my dad, and my uncle, my cousin uh, to take me. And we mostly hunted public uh, state forest property. Uh, as I got older, uh, one of my uh, best friends, uh, he has a really nice farm in southern West Virginia. Uh, and that proved to be a, a great a great place for me to uh, hone my skills. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's just been, just been a really... I feel very fortunate to have a lot of a lot of mentors coming up, uh, you know, and, and learning the ins and outs of hunting, and, and a lot of great places to to uh, provide me the access to do so. Nice. Do you recollect your first hunting experience? Uh, complete hunting. It would be just uh, you know, be squirrel hunting. Okay. Sitting in a hickory grove on uh, on my grandfather's farm with my cousin uh, under some hickories and big oaks. And, uh, you know, the roar of his 12-gauge shotgun, and then he would, I was pretty much the retriever. I'd run down and grab those gray squirrels and fox squirrels. Uh, my first bow hunting recollection is uh, when I was 12, we went to that state forest I mentioned, Cooper's Rock, just up the road from Morgantown. Yep. And uh, we were in a hardwood creek bottom, and uh, maybe an hour after daylight, my my dad had put screwed in climbing or the winder steps and, and fixed in. Uh, two lock in, in stands in the dark, and uh, about an hour after daylight, uh, a six-point buck, and I think three or four doe came up through the bottom, and 
you know, they weren't anywhere close for a, a, a bow range, maybe 60, 70 yards. I just remember that, that uh, getting the shakes for the first time. And uh, <laughs> we'll, never, we'll never forget uh, that morning sitting in that tree with my dad. That's that's what it's all about. What what does hunting mean to you these days? What do you have a a philosophy or, or, or a deeper meaning of what hunting is and should be? Well, you know, you know, I'm 44 now, and it used to be uh, get out as much as I could and 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 go go go. But now it's it's about having fun and uh, you know getting away from work and getting away from all the hustle and bustle, taking a deep breath. And just really getting out in the woods and and enjoying time with family and friends and uh, you know just the just the peacefulness uh, that that the mountains or the woodlots or or wherever you may be can can bring you. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Describe to me. Let's paint a picture of Morgantown, West Virginia, pre two thousand ten. Tell me about the town. Who lives there? What's the town like? What's the what's the what's the vibe? It's a great town. I would classify it as an Average college town, okay. uh, population of about 30,000, uh, which almost doubles when school's in session. Uh, it has a lot of fringe on, uh, you know, really rural, uh, rural countryside. Okay. But, um, and that's where this kind of story, I think, uh, comes into play. Uh, still has some green and, and parks and, and large private woodlots. Uh, we're a land grant. West Virginia University is a land grant university, so they have a lot of of property uh, that is incorporated into the city, mm-hmm. uh, two big uh, ag farms, uh, a dairy farm and an organic farm. Okay, all right. Uh, that that bump right up against the city, so it's pretty typical, I would say, land grant university college town. Okay, that sounds sounds about right. Land grants and and you know, having working educational farms and facilities <laughs> makes total sense. So in West Virginia, the the climate is pretty calm. Right, I mean, West Virginia, you get uh, you get some snow, but generally speaking, you have decent temperatures all the way through the year. Is my guess compared to where I live, anyway. Exactly. Uh, you know, we have some we have some cold we- uh, weather, we have some snows, uh, but it's 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 pretty mild compared to to your part of the country. Yep. Uh, summers are can be kind of warm at times, but uh, you know the mountains keep us uh, uh, pretty calm. Yeah. Yeah, and. Because of that, you have a thriving deer population, and there must be some other factors. Like it sounds like a good place for a deer to grow up, in addition to a, a, a hunter to be. Where? Do- yeah, I mean, just outside of Morgantown, uh, lots of lots of small private farms. Um, if you go, uh, you know, uh, south, just to south and, and and east, just a little bit in the some of the mount, more mountainous counties, you have a traditional uh, mountain, uh, you know, topography and big woods and, and yeah, lots of deer and the, the deer population okay. has exploded. And, um, certainly in town and in some of these areas that I'm sure we'll talk about today, mm-hmm. uh, the deer do quite well. Okay. What's the, what's the hunting sentiment where you are? What's, is the other, is there a variety or is it all pro, all, all negative, neutral, the, the typical 80, 20, scenario what are we looking at i think the i think that the it's it's very pro hunting okay uh, i don't know uh 80 20 i know the i know the 80 you're talking about and, and we always talk about uh the people that are not necessarily anti-hunters but are non-hunters and those are the people that we want to win over and if this project has taught me one thing it is there are a lot of open-minded people that uh are Maybe not necessarily ever been around or exposed to hunting, mm-hmm. but you know if you show them hunting in a in a positive manner and you are a responsible hunter uh, and you, you keep them informed and you ask permission and you let them know uh, what you're doing and how you're coming and going on their property uh, and they start to see uh, some improvements to their property and fewer deer, uh, they're all about it, and uh, we've done certainly a lot of that through this project. Okay. So let's talk about the project a little bit. The, you have a thriving deer community. You have a mostly pro hunting community. Where's the problem? You know, so far, there's no problem that's been described. Where, where do we bump into an issue that needs to be corrected? So in, in 
in 2010, mm -hmm. uh, the city was faced with mounting calls of uh, property damage, uh, auto deer accidents within the city limits. Okay. Uh, the city manager at the time uh, contacted Dr. David Samuel. Mm -hmm. uh, For, former guest retired, on our show. Yep. Former guest on your show, retired um, uh, wildlife professor here at WVU. Right. He put together a task force, and, and I was a member of that task force. And we put together a report that gave the, uh, the city – every option possible from an organized bow hunt to how much it would cost to, to trap a deer to sharpshooters, the, the whole nine yards. Okay. Uh, he submitted that to city council. Uh, they took a look at it. Couldn't really make a decision in 2010. However, uh, in 2011, in I believe February or March 2011, there was a company that was doing some aerial uh, deer counts in Maryland they were based out of Washington State, uh, and they provided uh, the city with a substantial discount to their service because they were already going to be flying over from the job in Maryland. Mm -hmm. uh, they did a thermal deer count within the city limits. It's all done with GPS. Uh, they guaranteed their data to be 97 or 98 percent accurate. They turned this data over. Dr. Samuel and I think some of his colleagues synthesized it and determined that, uh, you know, we now had some tangible proof, and I believe it was over 65 deer per square mile in some areas of the city. 65. Yeah. Wow. And hearing hearing that uh, uh, with some follow-up meetings, uh, that we had unanimous support uh, to begin organizing a uh, urban archery deer hunt. Okay. Uh, in the fall of 2011. That's that's exciting to me because you, you you hear about the white buffalo being hired by the non-hunting community or the where the, there needs to be a culling. But you very rarely hear, well, let's put together a package and an idea, a concept, and present it to the community and then bring our citizens in. So the citizens are accepting the, the citizen bow hunters in the community as, as a resource to thin out 65 deer per square mile. Let's go through the proposal. How did this all develop uh, in, in a little more detail? So you've identified that you've got more deer per square mile that you, than you really need. Uh, Dave Samuel probably proposed that, the, you know, this is too much, right? You're, you're Not only are you trying to save and help the community, but from uh, over-browsing and uh, probably hurt, hurting the, the deer population at the same time. Yeah, and, and you have we had a public, uh, citizens of Morgantown, okay. that, you know, you had to you had to to win over and to win them over the package that we put together was um all of our hunters would go through a mandatory uh i believe it's international uh, bow hunter education foundation is the correct term okay but all of our hunters go through that one day course uh they also take a, a shooting proficiency test uh, it's you know four out of five arrows at 20 yards in an 8 inch circle mm -hmm. And I worked very closely with the city manager, and we outlined very specific rules. And we turned that back to city council, and they were more accepting. You know, um, there was some uh, there were some adjacent cities that had uh, urban hunts. They were not planned very well, mm -hmm. uh, and so there was a lot of, as you can imagine, there was a lot of uh, negative feedback from them in terms of. You know, it's, it's so so we had to do something different. It had to be organized and it had to be done right. And personally, uh, as somebody who is hunting has given so much, uh, I wanted to be a part of that. And I wanted to be a part of showing the, the community that, you know, we can offer a pretty valuable service and we can do it in a discreet, safe manner. Okay. What was that meeting like, the first meeting? How, would, how did that all break down? Well, I mean, you know, everybody in the room – we had to, it wasn't made just of uh, of bow hunters. There was a lot of bow hunters, but there were yeah. also some city council representatives. Okay. Uh, there was a representative from the university. Uh, and in fact, the university were the first proponents and the strongest proponents early on. Hmm. They had the two ag farms, and uh, they had interests uh, to keep the deer down. Uh, but we had a lot of people there that, uh, you know, me as a bow hunter, you as a hunter, knows that if things are done right and you follow safety uh, protocols, you can 
bow hunt pretty much anywhere. But these people didn't, you know, some of these people didn't understand it. So, you know, we looked, we gave them the, the numbers and the data. And, you know, it cost, I can't remember how much, I think it was over $1,000 uh, if you wanted to trap and transport a deer. Uh, you know, snipe shooters or, or sharp shooters, uh, you know, you, you tell people, yeah, these guys are going to come in at night into the parks, into your neighborhoods, and and it comes down to there are already hundreds of communities across the country doing this efficiently, safely, uh, and it was the really the no-brainer choice. Okay. So once we once you provide people information and and kind of give them a good idea of the options, uh, it was it was a, a easy choice for the, the decision makers in town. So let's let's recap this a little bit. You, so you had there was a company that was doing some flyovers in Maryland, I believe you said. Yeah. And they just happened to decide that they should do a flyover over Morgantown. Well, no, our so the our our city government had contacted them about it. Okay. And you know that the the initial the initial consultation must have fallen okay. through. What and what but you they called them back. They called them back and said, "Hey, we're going to be in Maryland already." Uh, would you be interested in us providing this service at a discounted rate since I see. we're going to be there? Okay. So there was a concern at the city council level prior to this actually occurring. Yeah, uh, because people thought, well, how do you know how many deer are out there? Mm. How do you know there's an overpopulation? Okay. And uh, we need to see we need to see real data. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the number of car accidents, the number of private landowners who reported damage to their landscaping or, or their gardens, uh, that wasn't enough for people. The data was a very tangible, uh, real thing you could put your hands on. Wait, when did that first I- concept come into play? Was it, was it before the flyover or was it, it, it must have occurred prior to the flyover. Like there must've been, somebody came forward, somebody said something that, Hey, there's, I, I've been in three accidents because of deer. W- where did that first initial thing start? Any idea? Yeah, it was it was people calling the city manager's office and complaining. Okay, complaining about property damage, complaining about car wrecks. Uh, on our committee, we had, uh, uh, I believe, two. Our initial uh, committee, we had two police officers uh, and two city workers hmm. who worked at night, and they told these stories of driving around town uh, at two, three in the morning, and the numbers of deer uh, that they that they saw. Uh, on a regular basis across the city. Hmm. So you start adding everything up and, uh, you know, the data, the flyover data simply verified what all these people would, had previously stated. Gotcha. All right. So there's a concern from citizens to the city council. City council is getting a lot of calls. Exactly. They put out exactly. the feelers on a flyover to support some of the, the information that they're getting, um, subjective data. Now they want a, they want a scientific count done basically by a company that does this there's a they decline the original quote or whatever it was and then this same company happened to be doing a flyover because they're already in maryland and they say hey we'll, we'll give you a discount for the same information that you wanted a little while earlier exactly right. he said okay let's let's put that together what year was that uh that was in the the winter of 2011 the early spring of 2011 okay all right and when did the task force come into play, which you are part of, but there was a, you had to present data. You had to present the flyover data. You had to present the concerns of the citizens. And what what was the task force for and how did that get developed? So it was developed and, you know, initially started in 2010 and, and we'd given them those proposals. And in 2011, after the flyover data, we reconvened and you know, the, the city manager had the data in his hand, and uh, that is when everything came to fruition with the hunt. And, uh, you know, it supported everything we had said, and uh, it supported everything that everyone uh, had been complaining about or, or talking about. And, uh, you know, we had a really supportive city manager at that time. Okay. Still do, but we had a different gentleman in the office. And, uh, you know, he placed a lot of trust on uh, Dr. Samuel on myself and, uh, you know, obviously everyone that the city was going to provide a permit to, uh, to, to try this new project out. Okay. When did Dave Samuel come into the picture? 
he was the first contact in 2010 when uh, when the city, you know, were, were being flooded with calls. I reached out to Dr. Dave and mm-hmm. said, you know, would you be willing to volunteer to put a task force together to provide the city with some some solutions, possible solutions to our deer problem? Mm. Uh, he did. Uh, and in 2011, uh, once we decided we were going to go forth with a hunt, he said, you know, I'm, I'm swamped right now. Uh, as he probably told you on his podcast, uh, he had some health issues. He didn't have the time right. or the energy uh, to see this through. And um, he asked for vol- a volunteer to, to, uh, to oversee this. And, you know, it was a no-brainer. I raised my hand and, and never looked back. Gotcha. So were you the front guy? Were you the person that was in charge of the task force? No, he was. He was. He was, but at the point of the task force, you know, kind of breaking up, he asked for someone else to oversee the hunt and regulate the hunt and gotcha. work with the city uh, to oversee it. Okay. So that's where you came into play. That's where I come into play. All right. So there was a, there was an agreement. The, the citizens of Morgantown came together and they said, okay, we've got – a consensus. We've got the data. We've got the, the that we need to reduce our deer population here. It, we're overpopulated for the benefits of the deer and the benefits of the people that live there. A symbiotic relationship, in other words, between deer and people. And the task force goes into play. You get there's a meeting. There's you have an agreement that something needs to be done. What what were the let's break down the the task force bullet point schedule. Like what what are what are you what's on your to do list? Once you get approval from Morgantown Council, so Dr. Dave also writes a, a outdoors column mm-hmm. uh, on Sundays in the uh, the local paper. So he talked about this process, and uh, we we set up a meeting for anybody that was interested uh, to participate. And we had some some uh, you know advertisements on the radio. There was some talk there, and uh, the city gave us a building. Uh, recreation building to hold the meeting in. Um, that was the first step. And, and that meeting was interesting. It was standing room only. Mm. And uh, Dr. Dave gets up there and, and talks about this hunt. And he said, um, okay, guys, gals, uh, this first hunt uh, this year, um, you know, it's, it's to support the, the Morgant- city of Morgantown's uh, population control strategies. Um, you're going to be allowed two deer and it's going to be does only. Okay. And probably 25 people walked out the door. Why? Why? Uh, because they were. I think a lot of the people were interested. I'm gonna. I'm gonna get a city uh, deer permit, and I'm gonna come shoot a shoot a Pope and Young buck that uh, that I see when I'm driving through town. Right. Okay. And that's not the objective. That wasn't the objective then. Uh, that's not the objective now. Do we kill some nice bucks in town? Uh, absolutely. But that's not the objective. So that was the that was the first step, and and uh, you know he said, okay, everybody here, uh, if you're going to be uh, hunting in the city, you'll have to go through a mandatory one day uh, hunter safety class, bow hunter education class. Okay. And fifteen or twenty other people left. <laughs> and uh, when the dust settled from that, he turned to me and said, these are the these are the men and women that we want on board with us. Okay. So you br- Dave's bringing up topics of how this is going to go down. And exactly. the interest level starts to dwindle and they exit the meeting as things <laughs> yeah. get, get presented. But when it's all said and done, when the dust settles, you're left with a population of bow hunters that are eager to help you out in under the circumstances laid out by Dave. Exactly. We're talking, I'd, I'd say probably that initial group, 80 to 85 uh, bow hunters, men okay. and women from, from all across the, the, the city. And yeah, those are the people that were genuinely uh, interested in 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 participating. Okay, the hunt itself is it is it during the the standard or was it designed to be done during the standard bow season for that area, based off of the state requirements, or is this more like a a, a deprivation permit where you're going to hunt them all year round? It's a little different. Uh, the state of West Virginia, the Division of Natural Resources that oversees all of our, our regulation of our fish and game, uh, they provide cities, uh, even homeowners associations, with the option to have an, an urban archery hunt. Uh, the the um, season 
they have a defined urban archery season. It starts about a month earlier than the normal uh, archery season. So right about the first or second uh, Saturday of September. So it's it's also, you know, that's a nice incentive mm-hmm. to participate. You're, you're out there a month before the normal season. Uh, and then it runs through the end of the year. Okay. And it runs through the end of the year, and it closes when everything else closes. The nice thing about this, the other really big incentive, uh, you know, that first year we only had two tags. Now we have seven tags a person, and they don't count against your regular number of, of deer tags. Okay. So they're extra tags. They're extra tags. Yep. All right. So in, in 2017, uh, you could you could harvest five does and, and two antlered bucks. Okay. And are these tags and the number of tags that are being delivered, are they broken down in such a way that you say, I've got 80 hunters here. I need to eliminate so many deer and, and get that, that 65 deer per square mile down to a, a different number. What's the goal? And is it based off of the number of people that showed up to volunteer? They're not, and I think for number one, uh, out of that eighty, out of that eighty, and we had sixty-four hunt with us this year. You know, some of them will hunt, you know, consistently throughout the year. Uh, some of them, once the regular seasons hunt, you know, opens up uh, the bow season, the rifle season, uh, their participation tapers off. And to be honest with you, those first couple of years, uh, somebody would say, "Well, what's your, what's your your goal for your harvest?" Right. And it was simply as, as many as we can get with the tags we have uh, because the numbers were so skewed uh, population-wise in the city. Uh, you know, we needed to harvest as many as we could. Okay. So I'm trying, to in, I'm trying to draw a visual on this. So you've got 80 people that need to hunt in an urban setting. How do you, how do you strategize that? Like, do, do, tell me about how you end up putting 80 people in an urban setting to hunt a lot of deer and work within the community to get permission to go on certain lands. How do you exit? How do you enter to the, so that it keeps the people happy, but that it also strategically is good for the deer hunt itself as we know deer hunting to be, meaning like I got to go in downwind of where the deer are. I need to make sure I'm going to a spot where I can actually have a shot because even though, there are a lot of them. Yeah, it's easy to see them. They still have their survival mechanisms in place, and you still have to outwit the deer. Yeah, the, I'm not going to lie to you. The, the first year uh, was very challenging, right. simply because the city pretty much claimed the first year as a pilot. Okay. So we used uh, all of the WVU properties, which at that time I think was about nine, okay. eight or nine and we had two public property or private properties, and, and you know we we got them on there, and uh, you know people rotated, and it, it wasn't great, but it worked out. And the end result, we we took forty five deer uh, that first year, okay, and took forty five deer. There were no accidents. Uh, there were no deer with an arrow running down uh, Main Street, Morgantown. Uh, Everybody's children were safe that were playing in their backyards. Right. And I presented this to city council, and we got the green light to begin entertaining uh, private landowners that wanted to us to come on their property. Okay. And that's when that's when uh, things really started to open up. All right. Did you have any opposition? Uh, a little, uh, very very uh, minor. I think probably the same level. As you get in most towns, uh, you know, uh, it wasn't. I, I would really imagine there would be some hunter harassment or something like that, but it wasn't the case. Okay, it was people that would come to the city council and say they like to go to the park and and see the deer. And we had a guy that you know said he liked to run with the deer in the park. And um, you know, the 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 most vocal people uh, actually were the people that were feeding deer uh, and causing the problem. And that's that's probably one thing I forgot to mention. Along with our, uh, along with the um, the ordinance, the city ordinance that uh, allowed the hunt to happen. Uh, in that ordinance, there was a there's a, uh, a section about making it illegal to feed deer in the city, gotcha. uh, which obviously, as you know, creates part of the problem. Right. If you're going out to your bird feeder every night and putting out 20 pounds of cracked corn, so that was a, another step 
a non actually a non hunting step that the the city took to kind of help uh, you know regulate the deer from from just roaming the, the the neighborhoods. Gotcha. All right. So you've got year one under your belt. It was it was a success. You had forty five deer killed. You reported back to the council. The council said these these are great. Very limited uh, resistance from anybody, if you could even call it that. And year one is in the books, and this is in 2011. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. So fall of 2011. Fall of 2011. But what's the what's the strategy from there? You have to report. Does the plan change after year one to increase numbers? It seems like 45 deer is not a lot when you have 65 per square mile. How many square miles are we talking about that this 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 project has to encompass? I really don't know uh, the city, uh, but there's a lot of limitations. You know, once you get off those university properties, uh, the huntable properties, it's funny, deer can live in a, a small property that in some cases can never be hunted, whether right. it's the landowner isn't willing to let people on or uh, it's it's a, just a straight up and down hillside, you know? Right. Um so yeah, there's, there's we, and we still have challenges, and, and property acquisition is is the biggest challenge even today. Um, but there was a lot of people that came forward, and uh, they may have a, a three acre parcel, they may have a ten acre parcel, they may have a one acre parcel. But that one acre par- parcel, their neighbors on board too. Hmm. So that summer of 2012, uh, we put a lot of boots on the ground and went out and looked at properties and uh, patchworked properties together okay. uh, where neighbors and looked at aerial maps and uh, really uh, got some really good uh, good uh, initial relationships established between our hunters, the city, uh, and these private landowners. So you actually had landowners coming to you to say, hey, I'd really like you to come hunt my property too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Dr. Dave's also a member of the, um, uh, the, he sits on the board of a botanic garden mm-hmm. in town, and he's a member of a gardening club okay. here in town. And those are the those are the people that uh, you know like deer the least in many cases. So sure. we have got a lot of leads from him, but a lot of our leads came from people that had initially called the city to complain. So we followed up with them, uh, talked a little bit about uh, how we would uh, proceed. And uh, we had a lot of permission slips signed really quickly. Very cool. Very cool. So as as this had developed, were there more people that came forward after the fact that said, hey, it looked like you had a successful year safely and effectively? Did that bring more people out of the woodwork? It did. Yeah. There were, there were a lot of people in this town that uh, really were in a wait and see mode. Okay. You know, especially that, you know, people in that 80% that don't hunt. Yeah. And they were trying to see what would happen. And when nothing happened and it was all safe, yeah, we did have people. And I had people say that exact thing on the phone. You know, I I just wasn't sure how this was going to happen. I wanted to wait and see. And and now I'm convinced. So let's let's come out to my house and and take a look uh, at my property. Gotcha. Were there landowner hunters involved or... I guess in some cases you may, if they're already hunting their own land, that's then they're not really worried about, or was it a situation where they couldn't, they didn't have enough hunters, even though they did hunt and they still wanted population control. Were there actually hunters involved in the, that the, that were not part of the group that wanted you to come hunt in addition to themselves? Well, the, the way the, the city ordinance, uh, even before our project started, it was illegal to hunt in the city. Okay. So if you were already hunting in the city, you were hunting illegally and, we certainly ran into a lot of scenarios where uh, we found tree stands and things that weren't ours. Um, you know, we we found there were some some deer that turned up that that weren't ours. Um, but uh, you know, most of the people we do have a couple of landowners that uh, they, you know, as long as they went through our process, they could hunt they could hunt on their own property. Uh, going through the the safety class and things of that nature, and they got permits like anybody else, uh, but not not people that were already hunting and and or wanted to hunt their own property. All right, so it was illegal to hunt inside of city limits at this point prior to this. That's correct. Fascinating. All right, so the city really had they almost like in a sense 
they built their own problem because they didn't allow it to begin with. Yeah, and then to correct it, they had to they had to draft an ordinance. Right. And if you know anything about city government, it has to have a first reading, it has to have a second reading. You have a public hearing uh, to people that support or or against it, and then they take a vote on it. So that summer, that that was that entire summer of 2011. I was actually at the beach with my family in uh, in late July, mm. and Dr. Dave called me and said, "Hey, they voted tonight, and we got a unanimous vote." When you get back here, let's talk. Right. So, right. Uh, so that was, uh, you know, it was a. There's there was some additional. Yes, because of that, there was some additional groundwork the city had to to take on. Okay. So, you have eighty volunteers, and I wanted to back up a little bit to getting it off the ground. You said that they had to pass a proficiency test. Basically, you had to be able to to shoot, and it sounds like you might have incorporated safety. Um, the safety of bow hunting into the whole mix. Can you tell me how that all played out? And did, did you have to eliminate some people because they, they couldn't pass the test? Yeah. So we're really fortunate to, uh, two guys that live in the city that are friends of mine. Um, they're also, uh, affiliated with the West Virginia bow hunters association. Mm-hmm. Uh, they are both certified IBEF, uh, instructors. Okay. So, uh, we got a location outside of town, and we ran the class through that that building. During that day, everyone had to bring their bows and, and shoot. And I believe that first year, uh, we we did have one or maybe two uh, that 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 didn't pass the proficiency. Okay. And uh, you know, uh, it was it was handled very very low key, and they understood that uh, they couldn't they couldn't go on, and that they were fine with that, and and that's how it worked out. But you know anybody that, that takes a little time and has some pride in their their archery skills is is going to be able to keep four out of five arrows in a twenty uh, twenty yard in an eight inch circle. So that worked. That went went really smoothly. Okay, I mean that that seems very reasonable. I mean, eight inch circle is not that small. I mean, it's kind of big, right? It's not that small. It's a, yeah. a good size group at twenty yards. All these bows, whether it's compound and I mean recurve, you might might be a little different, but um, compound bows, especially with today's technology, you should be inside of eight at 20 yards almost every time. If you're, I agree. Right. I agree. I'd like to see it even smaller than that. Sure. Um, but, uh, you know, that's what, that's the regulations we were given and, uh, it worked out, it worked out real well. Okay. Are you allowing different kinds of weapons? Are you uh, like, uh, compound bows, primitive bows, um, even like, uh, any other advancements in, in bow technology? Is there, is it going beyond just the, the standard compound bow? Uh, well, initially we had some folks that had, um, I, I can't remember the name of the, the license. I want to say class Y. And at that time, uh, crossbows were legal, but they had a, a class whatever stamp where they could hunt with a crossbow. We allowed them in. Okay. And uh, that, that was fun. Uh, and then, I want to say two or three years ago, the state uh, the state made crossbow legal and had a had a crossbow season that kind of runs parallel with the regular archery season. But uh, we voted as a group to to maintain either you have a permit or you know had the instance where you would need to permit some sort of injury um, to remain with compound bows simply because uh, what we ran into is. People that that aren't around hunting, they see that a crossbow and they have no idea what it is. Yeah, I mean they still have problems with regular bows occasionally, um, but we just decided just to, it, it was just one other thing that we didn't want to enter into the mix. All right, so you're sticking with your compounds or or other, but not yes. not the crossbows. Yes. Okay, all right, not the crossbows unless you had that permit. Okay. Exactly. All right. So as a task manager, you've got 80 people to pick from. The majority of them passed the proficiency test. Um, is there a safety element in, in instruction to it as well? Yeah, you know, we really, uh, we really, and still now, uh, focus on uh, access as discreet as possible. Mm-hmm. Obviously, safety, um, shot placement. You know, there's you know a lot of skilled archers that hunt with us. That anywhere else, a, a forty yard shot's a chip shot. Right. But in the city. Let's keep our shots under 20 yards, and let's make sure these are slam dunk shots. Okay. All right. And um, 
you know, little things like that. In fact, just real quick on the on the access in and out. Mm. After that second year, uh, we had a woman. I was on a, a radio show, and she called and said, "How do I get deer hunters in my neighborhood?" <laughs> and uh, I said, "Well, ma'am, where exactly do you live?" And she said, "I live on 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 Vandalia Road." Mm-hmm. And I looked at my my data sheet real quick, and I said, "Ma'am." We had uh, 12 hunters in that area this year, and they, they took uh, you know, 20-some deer. And she said, but I didn't see anybody. <laughs> and I said, that is the, that's what we're, that's what we're, we're uh, going for, uh, so thank you. That's the strategy. So that was great. Yep. People didn't, you know, we parked behind people's houses, enter these woodlots. You take five steps, you're in the woods in most cases. Mm-hmm. Uh, discretion is is such a big thing for us even though it's accepted now uh we still want to be discreet we still want to be low-key very interesting statement right there okay now how do you i mean you're in charge of these group of volunteers pass the proficiency test safety elements you come up with a strategy of how to shoot where to shoot how to go into a property discreetly how do you decide based off of the maps where are you going to place them where are you going to put all these people that's a good question too because that first couple of years, it was, you know, a lot of people uh, chose where they hunted based on where they lived and where they worked. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I can be here in five minutes from my office. I can, you know, it's only two minutes from my house. And it sorted itself out pretty well. Um, some of the, the more high profile areas, like uh, some parks, mm-hmm. uh, we have uh, an arboretum here on campus. And, uh, you know, some of the, the higher profile uh, where there was going to be a lot of interfacing with the public. Uh, there were some guys that volunteered for that and, uh, they wanted to, you know, they wanted to, to represent bow hunters in those areas mm-hmm. and then they did a fantastic job. Uh, so it, it, it seems like a pretty daunting, but it all settled out pretty good. Okay. Pretty easy. All right. So did you have to have, after you did your topographical search and probably property line, uh, uh, data, I would think, you know, a mapping of who owns what and, and is it within a certain, did, did you have like a, a target uh, property that you were looking at? Like, okay, we want to hit these five in this particular zone. If we can, we've got uh, six people who said we can hunt their property and I've got five volunteers that can go there. How does, how does that yeah. all set up? So we, we had the list of properties. We knew how many we could uh, put on each property to, you know, give space. Uh, you know, there were there were situations where friends would decide to share a stand, and they would you know work out rotating through that. Then we would look at the maps, and you know that was before we I had Onyx maps right uh, on my phone. But we would uh, you know the grueling task of downloading a, a property map from the the tax office and and looking through the numbers, finding out who owns it, uh, and then knocking on doors and and talking to different people and. Uh, you know, it's a lot easier now, seven years later, but um, we spent a lot of time on the on the maps and on the phones in these areas where we knew there was a lot of deer uh, to get additional access. Okay, gotcha. And what's the, um, what's, what are the, the, the tools that you're using? What are the devices that you're using other than your bow? What, what other things are you bringing into play here? For, I mean, and I would think property owners would want to know, like, well, okay, I'm going to have a hunter. He's going to have a weapon. What else are you going to have? Well, the one concession we have in our rules, we have no screw in tree steps. Okay. Um, uh, you can use a ground blind, um, and we have a few people that use ground blinds, and they work out real well in certain situations. But I think the majority of our hunters use ladder stands and or uh, sticks and stands, you know, lock-on stands. Mm-hmm. And uh, that seems to be probably the sticks and stands are, are probably the most prevalent uh, usage uh, with our hunters. And and you're right. There was a lot of education with that as well. You're showing the landowner, you know, I'm this is what I'm going to be bringing in, and and we've not had any instances of problems with that. Uh, they are really happy to know that uh, all of our hunters that are hunting from a, an elevated stand are required to wear a safety harness. Okay. So we have guys that either you know uh, clip in when they get into the tree or or have a lifeline set up, and uh, those are real common. But uh, you know, that's the other thing. Uh, our state code has a, a, a little blurb in there about uh, landowner liability. Okay. So 
that got us access to to some property where people were, well, I'd like to hunt, but I'm afraid to get sued if you get hurt. Well, we refer to them as a state code that says, you know, landowners aren't liable once they give uh, permission to hunters or fishermen. And that got a, got us in the door on a couple places. So that worked out real well, too. So uh, our hunters quickly became educated to, uh, you know, the information that they could give to a prospective landowner and help them better make make a better uh, decision uh, on whether they're going to let us hunt or not. Okay. Well, that that's that was my next question. Being in a litigious society, how do you go about breaking through the the barrier of well, I don't want to get sued, and or what happens if somebody does get hurt on the property? Obviously, the landowner's not liable in this case because of the the, the law of the state. But what about on on the case of well, I, I volunteered to be part of this group, much like you'd be part of a volunteer fire department. If they get hurt, they have insurances. Is there any kind of a uh, insurance policy you got to have, you have to put together in order to protect your volunteers? Uh, no, because we're you know we're we're serving as volunteers. Uh, the the rules uh, in there, the, the city lawyer has a section in there. Um, anybody that participates in this program can't hold. Uh, the landowner or the city of Morgantown liable mm-hmm. uh, for that. So, you know, knock on wood, we've not had any accidents. And certainly, you know, in this in this uh, current legal climate, it's always a concern. But I think that's where we come in with uh, just the under uh, unbelievable stress on safety. You right. know, safety for you and safety for the people around you. And uh, the people that are that are hunting with us now have certainly bought into it a hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. The volunteers that are involved in the organization are they given any kind of identifier so that a landowner knows that hey they're they're part of this city group that are coming in to help me reduce the deer herd or it's uh, do they get membership cards or how, how is a person supposed to know whether they're, they're part of the group? Yeah. So every fall uh, I provide the city with the list. Uh, they provide a, you know, a annual permit for that year, mm-hmm. and uh, has the city manager signature on it, has the hunter signature on it, and uh, you know they're they're having on them at all times. Okay. And uh, certainly, uh, I give that same list to the chief of police, for the city of Morgantown, the same list to the West Virginia University campus security, and uh, everyone is on the same page as to who should be out there legally they can look at that list and and know exactly who is and who isn't supposed to be out there hunting gotcha fascinating so it's a, it's a big coordinated hunt basically that to, to satisfy the needs of the community it's a, it's a fascinating story so this this started all back in 2010 it's 2018 now where what has transpired since that 2011 initial season uh to today and where is it going to go so we're looking at uh you know, in, in our first seven years, uh, we've harvested 712 deer. Okay. Um, in that process, we've uh, made some incredible relations uh, with our uh, public and private landowners, uh, people that will, will, with the drop of a hat, go to bat for us, uh, city council or on social media. Uh, possibly the thing I'm most proud of in this, this whole project our hunters have donated 6,778 pounds of ground venison to food uh, kitchens, soup wow. kitchens, uh, nonprofit organizations within the city uh, to help those in need, uh, you know, that feed people. Fascinating. I mean, that's given back to the community uh, even beyond that. Yeah, and it's almost entirely, uh, you know, volunteer-driven. Mm-hmm. Our hunters, when they harvest a deer, they have the option to keep the deer or donate it to this program. Okay. Uh, they drive the, the deer up to the processor just outside of town, drop it off. When the uh, processor has uh, you know, a freezer full, 12, usually 12 to 15 deer of our deer, mm-hmm. uh, they call me and uh, we organize a, a pickup uh, and then a drop off at these various uh, organizations. And I tell you, it's it's pretty powerful uh, to go into one of these, you know, church basements that, that have a soup kitchen or a, or a small nonprofit organization and, and literally fill the entire chest freezer up with, 
two pound packages of ground ground venison. Right, right. That's a pretty good feeling. That's a very good feeling. So, do you have a a, des- a dedicated processor that's working with you? We do, we do. They're just outside of town, and uh, they've worked out a a, a deal with the city. Mm-hmm. Uh, they charge a set a set price uh, to to process that deer, grind the whole deer up and packages in two pound packages. And it's worked out really well, really well. I'm very, very proud. And, and, you know, it's just the, the selflessness of, uh, of these hunters, okay. uh, to, to take 20 minutes to drive up there and, and, and donate that deer. And, uh, because they know, uh, who it's helping out, it's helping people that, that live with, uh, with us you know, here in the city. Does the processor donate their time as well? No, they charge them. Okay. Uh, they charge the city, but they charge them a, a rate that's, I think, pretty fair compared okay. to regular processing fees. Okay. So that's the only that's the only part of that equation that the city is involved with is just the financial. Okay. And, and if you had to look at a budget sheet, are there costs associated with this program? There's really not. Okay. That, the 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 deer donation uh and then the the time to print the permits now that's it yeah, this is a this is a really great example of a uh, a well run volunteer effort uh and just happens to be uh tied to bow hunting and and community service so okay. it's it's a win win for everyone gotcha do you have other communities reaching out to you that now that you've kind of set the groundwork for how this should go down and, and showing a success in a in such a program that people from other communities in the United States reach out to you and say, hey, we've got the same problem. What do we do? Yeah. I've talked to some people uh, here in the state uh, that are, that are considering getting a uh, urban hunt off the ground. Mm-hmm. Um, we're also, um, I think this spring, uh, some of our bow hunters that live in some adjacent cities, and when I say adjacent, I mean 15 minutes away, 10 minutes away, uh, are going to approach their city councils about a, a possible uh, urban deer hunt. So it's wow. it's it's uh, really good. And I think the, the success we've had here uh, makes it uh, easier for another city to understand and accept. Gotcha. Are, are out-of-staters welcomed into this program, or do you have to be part of the, the state? We don't have any limitations on that, but uh, I don't know anybody that that we don't currently have anybody from out of state. I guess the the best example we had some university students uh, that that hunted with us for a couple years and until they graduated and then they went on their on their way. But that'd probably be the only instance I can recall of you know out of state uh, hunters. Hmm. Gotcha. Very interesting. It's a fascinating story. Just it's a good. It's a feel good story, but it's also a like th- there's a purpose to this, not just a feel. It's not just a feel good. There's actually a purpose here, uh, which is it's a, the best. It's yeah, it's the best public service, community service you could ever draw up. Right. Really. Right. Fascinating. Excellent. Well, right, let's uh, let's go on a, a memorable deer hunt with you, Rick, if we could. Maybe it's part of this program. I don't know. You've you've been at this for a while now, um, and as part of our program here, we like to hear a good deer story before we part ways for a, a, a while. Um, where are we going to go? We will go to a, a piece of property here in the city okay. uh, that uh, that's owned by the university. And uh, in the, I guess that would have been the the summer of 2013. Okay. Uh, I I hung a camera on this new piece of property, and I'd taken my daughter Summer. Uh, she was probably, well, I guess she was probably about 10 or 11 at that time. And uh, we went and we hung some trail cameras and put out some trophy rocks and, and uh, started checking those cameras in mid-July and, and got a really nice nine-point buck on there. Hmm. And uh, long story short, she decided to name him Nails. Okay. And uh, we watched Nails. I, I wasn't going in a lot, uh, maybe once every two, two and a half weeks. And um, I kind of fell into a little trap of, it was in a, it was in a, a a deep creek bottom on a on a real steep hillside, and I had pretty good access to it. Um, so I kind of fell into those trail cam trap of those pictures of him in there, and I knew he was bedding close by. And uh, it didn't take but more than two sits to figure out, uh, you know. And this is this is probably you know, late October. I decided to stay out of there uh, until he started the daylight. Hmm. And um, you know, it, it didn't take too long to figure out that the wind in that bottom was 
was just horrible. And and speaking of that, the the wind in my office air vents kicked on high, so apologize for that. <laughs> it's okay, I don't hear it. It's my daily uh, fresh air, I guess. But uh, you know, uh, we went back, we went back in. I looked at the the aerials uh, at the far end of that property. I got access to that property through another piece of private property, and all I wanted was access. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they granted me that. And, uh, the third week, third Sunday of uh, November that year, summer again, went in with me. She's my good luck charm, uh, when I can get her out in the woods. And, uh, she and I went in on the other end of that property and, uh, found a really nice stand tree, hung the stand tree, hung the stand up, slipped out of there, slipped back in there for the first sit, uh, the following Saturday. And, uh, here came nails about 15 minutes before the end of shooting light, chasing a doe, and uh, gave me, I don't know, I'd say 18, 19-yard cording away shot, um, made a perfect shot. Uh, he ran out of sight, and uh, I could I could see some brush crashing. I, I'm pretty sure he'd, he'd crashed, hmm. and uh, the doe he was chasing had no idea what was happening. She ran up and was standing directly under me. So I knocked another arrow, and she walked out and gave me a beautiful 10-yard quartering away shot. So I had two deer uh, on the ground. I called my brother up, who, who doesn't hunt, but is a fantastic deer dragger, uh, deer skinner, <laughs> and uh, right. said, hey, Kirk, I, I need some help. Um, so, you know, for me, that hunt was great for a number of reasons. I'd never followed a buck that closely before. Yep. Um, and to have my daughter as part of it, it was great. Uh, the funniest thing we learned from that buck, he had dropped off my truck camera the, the first or second week of October for about three weeks. And when he finally showed back up, I noticed he had a scar on his back. Hmm. And uh, when we took it to the processor to have him caped out, uh, he had a uh, three-blade muzzy broadhead and about eight inches of uh, carbon shaft stuck in the uh, the top of his shoulder. No kidding. And it was already starting to heal over. And I can tell you from the trail camera pictures and that night chasing that doe, it, it did not affect him one, one bit. Right. So that was kind of amazing. Right. Yep. Excellent. Excellent story. I've got 10 rapid fire questions for you, Rick. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Bring them on. Bring them on. All right. What's your number one hunting tip of all time? I have fun. Okay. I think that's what the, the last... Uh, dozen years have taught me is just just get out and have fun and you know you can put you can put uh you can be prepared you can put emphasis on it without making it so serious right that's a great one all right we all have these things that we'd like to bring into the woods with us maybe they're a good luck charm maybe they're something else and it drives us crazy if we don't have it with us in the stand or wherever we're hunting what's that one thing for you uh it's the little wind checker little plastic yeah uh, puff sure. bottle yeah i like those I, too I, I have to have that with me. Yep. Yeah, I love those. What's your biggest pet peeve in life? Uh, people that litter. Hmm. Uh, you know, I I spend a lot of time in the backcountry fly fishing for trout when I'm up, yep. scouting for deer, hunting deer. Yeah. And to find a, a pile of trash at a, at a pool off, a parking area, uh, it, it absolutely drives me crazy. I get that. I, I pick up trash a lot. You know, hike up and down my road, find a piece of trash in, my, in the woods goes in my pack, comes home, goes in the proper barrel. Fantastic. And people wonder why landowners uh, oftentimes uh, are hesitant to give permission to hunt. Mm -hmm. And it's because they've been burnt some way. And they've left trash. They've left gates open. They've driven through a pay field Mm -hmm. uh, in a a rainy season. Um, It just comes down to basic respect. Right. I agree. Completely agree. All right. How old are you today, Rick? Um, 44. 44. All right. What would you tell the 22 year old Rick Bebout, knowing what you know today? I would say, uh, work to keep your father, uh, your dad into archery. Uh, my dad's work schedule was hectic. He, he was a union millwright mm-hmm. and, um, uh, worked a lot of hours and he would shoot his bow all summer and then, uh, be sent out of town for a month in the fall. Gotcha. And, uh, by the, by the late eighties, he had given it up. Gotcha. Okay. All right. You meet a stranger at a hotel lobby, some ho- some hunting convention in the world, and they ask you what you do for a living. What do you tell them? 
Uh, I work uh, in IT and higher ed, uh, build and maintain online uh, courses Mm -hmm. and support faculty and students uh, in those courses and also uh, teach as a secondary role. Very nice. All right. What did you have for breakfast this morning? I had a peanut granola bar and about six cups of coffee. (laughs) Sounds like one of my breakfasts. I get that. All right. You get your own billboard on the side of a highway. It's a blank canvas. You can put anything you want on it. What would it say? Don't litter. Don't litter. How about that? There you go. Don't litter. Yep. All right. If I give, if I say the word successful to you, who's the first person that pops into your head and why? Uh, my dad. Okay. My dad worked uh, really hard for, for our family, put me and my brother through college, uh, never missed a baseball game, um, got me in the right path for hunting and fishing. And, uh, you know, he's still one of my biggest uh, advocates for everything I do. Gotcha. All right. Very good. All right. What's a typical day in your life look like? Uh, up early and uh, coffee. I get the girls, uh, my daughters ready for school and uh, work. And, and work can be is different usually every day, but mostly a lot of computer work and a lot of phone calls and some meetings. Mm-hmm. And uh, then a quiet evening in the basement, uh, usually at the end of the day, catching up on, on email and, and sports and everything else. Gotcha. Very good. And then finally, what's a typical deer hunting day in your life look like? Well, a typical deer hunting day, if I'm hunting in town, I'm, I'm, out, I'm, I'm blowing out of the office at noon. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to go home and, and grab a scent-free shower and uh, make a short drive to a, a small woodlot or uh, a decent-sized woodlot and slip in there. And hopefully, uh, at the end of the evening, knock on a landowner's door to tell them that uh, I've been successful and uh, I'll be a little bit late, uh, you know, dragging a deer uh, back to my truck. Very nice. Excellent. All right, those are the 10 rapid-fire questions, Rick. Rick, I, I really appreciate you coming on the show and sharing your story about this project you have going on in, in Virginia. It's Or West Virginia, excuse me. It's it's fascinating, and I don't hear a lot of stories like this, but this is one that we have to model, I think, over and over again, even if it's not necessarily exactly what, what's going on, just, just the way you you went about it and got support from the community and then went in and showed that it can be a success and is a continued success safely, effectively, and efficiently, and discreetly. I think it's just perfect. So well, job well done. Well, I appreciate that. And, and you know, I think that uh... – I think that this opportunity is is there everywhere across the country, and uh, I think if if cities, you know, you you hear about these cities that are wanting to sterilize deer and and bring in sharpshooters and and all this, it's it's totally unnecessary, right. and it's a complete waste of taxpayer money. I agree. And if they would just give bow hunters, ethical, safe bow hunters, uh, an opportunity. To showcase what they can do, uh, it would be such a such a better circumstance in, in many cases. Right, right. Completely agree with you. So, if we want to know more about this project, this program, do you have any social media associated with it, or is it, it kind of on the down low? No, it's not. the The city of Morgantown has a has a a website. Um, I'm not sure how up to date it is. I don't manage it at all. Yep. And usually. I get with uh, their web designer and, and update some content. So it may, I'm not sure to the, if it's updated with 2017, 2018 data yet. Um, we have a, a, a private Facebook group just because we wanted to keep things private and people could share harvest without the, you know, unfortunately social media is a, a farm for, for trolls and anti hunters. And mm-hmm. uh, so we decided, you know what, we're just going to keep this internal. Right. Uh, but certainly the city is very transparent and has a lot of uh, information on their website. Very good. Excellent. Well, Rick, this has been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. And uh, I'm honored to listen to how you put this all together. And thank you for doing what you're doing. Keep it going. Uh, I think we need more programs like this and need need that example to, to set the stage. So please, uh, whatever we can do to help you keep keep this thing alive, let me know. Well, I appreciate it, Jay. It's been a pleasure. And uh I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and have a great weekend. I really appreciate Rick Bebout coming on and reaching out to us to tell us that there is this amazing story going on in Morgantown, West Virginia. The, the, 
the whole concept that you can bring and organize 80 bow hunters eager to participate in helping the community to call some deer is exactly the blueprint that I think we should all follow in any urban setting without breaking the bank with a very small budget and without having to turn to what I think is kind of this unnatural mechanism of hiring professional hunters to come in and sharpshoot the deer when all you have to do is organize the hunters you already have. That's what they're there for. That's what they want to do. And this whole sterilization thing on Staten Island and the other sterilizations that are going on, it just seems ridiculous when you have a group of diehard bow hunters eager to help the community, eager to do the things that they love to do right at your fingertips. And all you have to do is organize it exactly like Rick did. So hopefully people were listening to the show and they'll use it as a model going forward for other urban area hunting. Dusty, do we have a Chubby Tines tip of the week this week? I, I'm going to try, Jay. You know, it's going to be a tough one, no doubt about it. But I'm, I'm definitely going to try. The Chubby Tines tip of the week is sponsored by Morse's Sporting Goods. Firearms, use firearms, bows, use bows. Located at 85 Kentucky Falls Road in Hillsborough, New Hampshire. Give Jim a call at 603-464-3444, morsessportinggoods.com. Your dollars go further in New Hampshire. There's no sales tax. Morse's Sporting Goods. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about hinge cutting trees, and now is the time. Uh, spring right around the corner. We're going to get into some uh, habitat management, uh, get your wood set up a little better. And if, if you're going to hinge cut, and you've been thinking about hinge cutting a few trees to make a few beds and maybe to direct the deer in a different direction, do some research on it. Get on YouTube and, and watch a guy's hinge cut trees. That way when you go out there, you're not just whacking trees and not knowing the process or the method. Take your time, do your research on hinge cutting, and uh, do it right, do it once, and, and you'll reap the benefits for years to come. That's a great idea. I'm fascinated with hinge cutting now. It's, we've heard this a few times. Barry mentioned it. You've talked about it. We've talked about it in some other shows. I'm just fascinated with the whole concept. So Yeah, it takes a little bit of skill with your chainsaw, but once you right. figure it out and you, you educate yourself about the process, You'll get it down pat, and uh, next thing you know, you're like an arborist out in the woods. That's that's very cool. Dusty, where can we find you when you're not hanging out here in the studios with me? Uh, shoot me an email, dusty at bigbuckregistry.com. You can look me up on Instagram and Twitter, at Chasing Antler, facebook.com forward slash chubby tines outdoors. Jay, where can the people reach out to you when you're not on the mic? Likewise, you can shoot me an email, jay at bigbuckregistry.com, and you can visit us on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash bigbuckregistry. We're also on Twitter, which is twitter.com forward slash bigbuckregistry. We are also on Instagram, instagram.com forward slash bigbuckregistry, and YouTube, which is youtube.com forward slash bigbuckregistry. On YouTube, you can listen to all of our podcasts in their entirety. As far as videos are concerned, it's a boring video, but the audio content is there, so you can actually listen to our podcast. You can also listen to all of our live shows that we've done on Thursday nights when we do do them, and we've gone back and interviewed, re-interviewed a lot of our previous guests we had on the show just to put a face to a voice, let's put it that way. You can always listen to our show on other places as well, not just YouTube. We're found on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher and Blueberry. And if you would like to submit a buck to our page for consideration and be featured on our page in front of 250,000 diehard deer hunting fans, all you have to do is go to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash my buck and all of the instructions will be right there. That's pretty much everywhere we're at. I think that's a wrap, Dusty. That's a whole lot of big buck, Jay. Sure is. I'm Jay Scott. I'm Dusty Phillips. And this is the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. We'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.